Welcome everyone to Pontus Fathom Press. This is our podcast episode 39. And today we're going to talk about uh, wrapping up our dragon series. We're going to talk about uh, the dragons and the reptilians, right? The, uh, this idea is out there in the uh, everywhere, everyone from the David Icke guys to everywhere that there's reptilian aliens or our reptilian origins, right? But I wanted to sort of ground it a bit more in biology, I guess. I'm like, so, you know, we've, we've done a lot of the spiritual side of things and we've gone a lot down a lot of this alternate history, you know, and all kind of in the spirit of world building or exploring with creative imagination. But this time I kind of wanted to take some of the, uh, some of what, what is trying to be interpreted literally or spiritually and align it to something that's more aligned to the genome, right? So the idea here is, you know, th there are, um, you know, if, if we even start with Freud, there's familial pressures, right, that, that shape our reactions to the world, right? And if we go beyond the family, Jung took us into the collective unconscious, right? Jung takes us into the collective unconscious things that all humans have a mother experience, all humans have a father experience. But we also have these things like the heroic journey in our place in the world and this, these mythologies of alchemy that come in play when we talk about transformation, they emerge in dreams. And if we kind of think of these uh, you know, genomic pressures that come not only from the, the idea of, of a heredity, but from the deeper genome all the way down to the instincts, um, you know, I sort of wanted to explore a little bit. Could all of this dragon stuff just be the fact that we evolved from dragons and it's some kind of, uh, it's some kind of internal wrestling with the Panksepian uh, instincts, you know, the amygdala and, and, and forming that. So this is just sort of what we're going to go through today. So we'll start high level. I've had some other books out on the table. They're quite uh, quite interesting. We've got the reptilian alien origins of the human species, the dragon legacy, which is another uh, Nicholas DeVere. It's another type of Lawrence Gardner. And we've got flying dragons and serpents, um, the story of mankind's reptilian past. You know, And here, interestingly enough, we've got this image here of the dragon as the tree which was sort of the idea of our um, last podcast which was the dragon and the cross right so you kind of have this idea that these all of these kind of come together so if we're talking about bloodlines you know we talked about the bloodlines in, in lots of these uh, Lawrence Gardner podcast uh, talked about the bloodline and you know and even holy blood holy grail um, they talked about the Holy Blood, Holy Blood Grail talked about the um, the Serpent Rouge, right? The Red Serpent, which sort of symbolized uh, Mary Magdalene's potential bloodline, right? But if we think of that Red Blood, uh, that Red Serpent, as not just the bloodline, but as the reptilian origins. You know, we start to get into something interesting. So let's kind of let's kind of go into some of these topics here. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot, guys, for for watching. Uh, uh, trying to get these a little bit more regular, so uh, bear with us. As you guys know, um, we have got a bookstore down below. If you want to go check out our bookstore, uh, we're actually putting together a collection of the podcasts in a uh, book form, and uh, I can uh, show you the proof copies. These are going to be available uh, later this year but we've gone ahead and taken the first podcasts and put them together we put them together in a three volume set here so we've got the Jungian alchemy and horror and science fiction uh, theosophical psychoanalysis of pulp fantasy and anime and then esoteric anthroposophy and culted science these will be available this year I'm in the process of proofreading these and uh, we'll probably end up putting together a whole volume just on these dragon lectures. I think we get about 11 uh, lectures in each one, in each volume. So uh, yeah, so look forward to a, a, an upcoming, probably by, I'd say, uh, end of, uh, middle of the year, probably by middle of the year, we'll probably put that one out as well. That'll be volume four. So go check those out. 
and go, go check out the other uh, offerings we have out there. And we really appreciate your comments below, liking and subscribing help to grow the channel. So thank you very much uh, to keep in touch and to and to comment below. I really love everyone's comments. I think it's great. You guys have some super insightful ideas, and I and I do respond to all of them. At some point, I'd like to grow this to a thousand subscribers and uh, do this as a live stream. So I think that would be real fun. Uh, I think. There's a lot of interesting uh, dialogues we've been having through the comment section and, and like to take that live. So, so yeah, thanks a lot for your support. So, uh, so, so jumping into this, you know, I think maybe the place to really start is if we go back to, you know, in the beginning, we have the Garden of Eden, right? And we start, sort of have that idea of the serpent's present there, presence in the Garden of Eden, right? And if we kind of um, take a look at that, this overlaps into many of the many of the um, uh, mythologies from the Sumerians onward, right? So we have this idea of um, there's snakes and dragons throughout all of the mythology, right? So if we go, let's, we'll start out with the dragon legacy here. And if we talk about the uh, idea of the Garden of Eden, you sort of have this idea of uh, uh, the, the tree of, the tree of good and evil, right? So you have this idea of the tree of good and evil and the serpent gives us that knowledge, right? And so in a way, um, where does knowledge start? Knowledge starts in our brains, right? So our brains are this place of knowledge. So the, the kind of idea I'm thinking of here is, um, what if this is just as simple as uh, the story of the amygdala? Right. So what is the amygdala? The amygdala is the, I think they call it the lizard brain, right? If we kind of go and take a look at uh, an image here, you, there's this idea of the reptilian brain here, right? So the idea here is, it says people are very comfortable with their uh, gardens. The idea of, in alchemy, the reptile of the dragon represents the non-transmutable base metal. In other words, not yet transformed into the desirable state of gold. It is still primitive and undeveloped. It is not, not, not yet evolved state of being. So uh, dragons are revered and worshipped in ancient literature worldwide, but they're also feared. So what is this fear, right? Uh, and there's a quote here from Carl Sagan. It does no good whatsoever to ignore the reptilian component of human nature, right, from the amygdala particular our ritualistic and hierarchical behavior. On the contrary, the model may help us understand what human beings are all about. So this, this brain stem uh, is the cause of so much human suffering, right? The idea of uh, wars, famine, disease, starvation, all of these kind of things that are rooted to um, our fight or flight way of being or our... Um, uh, our emotional kind of being. At least five human behaviors uh, originate from the reptilian brain. And the concept here is the, uh, the reptilian brain, you have fear, food, fornication, fighting. What else did I leave out? Uh, fear, food, fighting. I know they're the five Fs, but, the, but yeah, these, these are the... Uh, these are really the symbols of um, that reptilian uh, amygdala, right? So, so this, um, I guess, the idea here is if if it is the simply the idea that we evolved from a lizard brain, uh, isn't it interesting how that kind of fear response that feeding response, that fornication response, that um, flight response, um, all of our, uh, our um, anxiety comes out of this. And then what more of an anxiety than to have this um, personified, let's say, or projected upon a dragon image. And the idea of the fearful secret right it's a secret that we are of reptilian origins when in fact it's not a, that we were 
once reptiles. Perhaps it's just that we evolved from reptiles and then the, the, the mammalian part of us still has a genomic memory back to the reptilian part of us. And in the higher brain function of, uh, you know, of, the, of the outer brain, the outer chamber of the brain, you know, the, the mammalian brain, right? The cortex of the brain, uh, neocortex, where we've got uh, most of our homo sapiens is activated in this area, it's reconciling back to those instincts. And that gap between uh, uh, mammalia and amygdala can be the, the, the origins of all of this um, mythology. So just the same way that Jung would call out the uh, idea of our um, collective unconsciousness, maybe this is one of those kind of situations. So when we're looking into um, this idea, so let's go through some of these these cases. So it says the sex, successful creation of the ape man from the reptile hybrid, right? So if we think of this just as a kind of archetype, you know, we go back to the Epic of Gilgamesh, where you've got the idea of the wild man, right? So this wild man has to become civilized, right? Uh, he's living among the animals first, right? He's drinking and running with the animals, but he has to come to, he has to come to grips with this, um, idea of the reptilian image. So it says man created in the image of the reptile God. So the book of Genesis makes it abundantly clear that man was originally created in the image of God. God created man in his image. The, the divine image created he, he him. Male and female created he them. Since the Adam of Genesis uh, and of the Sumerians was created in the image of the serpent God, certain there be traces of this in the old scriptures. Indeed, once in the Gnostic version of the creation of man, one track describes Eve's reaction to the Garden of Eden. It said, uh, she looked at the tree and she saw it was beautiful and magnificent and she desired it. She also took some of its fruits and she gave them to her husband. And when they ate, the light of knowledge shone upon them. They were put to shame. They knew what they were naked with regard to knowledge. Right, so the idea here is the um, serpent nature is what was our nakedness. So the idea here is um, because we have these primitive instincts that are the limbic system, this automatic autonomic system, this fight or flight, uh, fear, fornication, these kind of anxieties and these um, uh, instincts that we have, that, that was our nakedness. We are naked in the fact that we are still we're still animals and only when we are transcending that through the higher brain through knowledge uh, does that kind of come through but you know as we started to dig into this a bit you start to see that there is this connection to the uh, to uh, Mary Magdalene again so here we go we have the idea of uh, now we know we, we've, we've done some podcasts before we talked about Mary Magdalene uh, and and in Magdalene you've got that idea of um, the Gnostic version of Magdalene <laughs> is quite different from the, um, the uh, Gnostic version. So, so that, that those books of the Bible that were excluded during the Council of Nicaea, let's say, that were, or, or some of those books that were discovered in the Nag Hammadi text, right? So in the mainstream version, it's sort of like um, Mary Magdalene it was a prostitute. And again, Prostitute is fornication. It's ruled by the amygdala, amygdala right? So uh, just hold that thought, right? So the idea thought that, that Christ forgave her as a sinner. This is the main story. And that they thought of her as a, um, um, as a prostitute. There's also some talk of, of Magdalene as a spendthrift. So the uh, Judas called her a spendthrift and accused her of idleness. Again, so now a spendthrift is impulsivity, right? So the idea of that is impulsive, amygdala, right? Oh, by the way, her name is Magdalene, Magdalene, amygdala, right? So, uh, so in this in this case, is she really the amygdala within the human brain, and she's positioned at the cross? at the cross of the cerebellum, 
right? So this is a kind of interesting, interesting idea. So that if you take this um, idea and you and you take it further, you've got this idea of um, the amygdala uh, is an almond almond shaped uh, mass of gray matter near the temporal lobe, the amygdaloid nucleus, right? And this is what's responsible for these perceptions of emotion. This is the fear and sadness and anger, and hunger, aggression, these things, right? So now if we think of this as a, a, a and align, aligned with uh, libido and fornication, right? The idea of fornication. So this is the um, origin of the dragon component because if you see this is the part of the brain that we share in common with the lizard now you see that the Christ brain is that cerebellum brain and now you have the marriage of the Christ and the Magdalene in the Gnostic texts and it's sort of like the higher brain and the older uh, you know we'll call it the Tiamat brain right the Tiamat brain uh, they merge together and at that crossroads the cross of the Mary and the Christ this is where you get the um, the complementing, the complementing of both parts, both parts of the brain working together, right? So some interesting things about this amygdala Magdalene um, uh, conjecture or conjunction. You know, we have this, um, so, you know, in, in the Gnostic text, we have Magdalene as the, um, uh, she's the, in some of these Gnostic texts, she's indicated as the wife of Jesus or the or beloved of Jesus. It says, in popular tra tra tradition, notwithstanding, the Magdalene is not in any point of the gospel said to be a prostitute. When she came to mention the gospel of Luth, she's described as a woman out of whom went seven devils. So this again, possessed by, possessed by what, right? Possessed by the Panxeptian instincts, possessed by the, um, the, um, those uh, core instincts, right? But the phrase may equally refer to some sort of conversion or initiation. The cult of Istar or Astarte, the seven mother queen of heaven, involved, for example, the seven stage initiation. Prior to her affiliation with Jesus, the Magdalene may have well been associated with a cult. Migdal or Magdala was the village of doves. And there was some evidence the sacrificial doves were bred there. But again, we see her as the fallen woman Right? And this kind of puts her, at least some of her story aligns with this co concept uh, potential of um, the amygdala. The other thing that's very interesting is she's also associated, there's many paintings, you guys, I don't have examples of it here, but there are many paintings of, of Mary Magdalene shown with a skull. And I just think that that's quite fascinating that we'd see her with a skull and thinking that it has something to do with the amygdala at the center of that, you know, so there's some kind of brain correlation, a skull and a brain and, you know, sort of this uh, grail also, right? A grail of the skull, right? Um, there's also this idea of the salmon of wisdom. The maiden lived in the salmon of wisdom. And, they, and this talks about the salmon of knowledge was not a fish. If one takes a whole salmon and cleans it, then spreads the pink flesh apart in an oval shape, it reminds one of uh, of an almond shape, and again we come back to that almond for amygdala, the almond shape of amygdala. It says it's fascinating that Scythians uh, have so many symbols and allegories in common with regards to the Holy Grail. The Scythian Gales share uh, the symbol of the well of the garden, of the forest of the fountain, and the and the Christian ichthys. Right, the ichthys is also an almond shape, right? And it says there's no doubt that. Christ existed as a living being. However, he was a dragon king of the Grail bloodline. The stories associated with Christ are Rosicrucian and alchemical. Uh, the salvation that he preached to his disciples was not obtained through faith, but knowledge or gnosis. And again, this is the gnosis of overcoming that primitive um, uh, lizard brain, right? So if we keep going here, we, we say that there are a corresponding subtexts and symbols beneath the stories of the virgin birth, his life and death. So he becomes the allegory of the blood's quality and potential, which includes the evolution, right? 
If he is the ichthys related to the salmon of Necton, then the blood of Christ shed for the remission of sins is not the blood of Jesus, but the Messiah, the Messe, or dragon kings, shed by the salmon. The salmon lies at the bottom of the well in the Gaelic and Frankish tales, Melusine, and is guarded by the dragon maiden. However, in the Song of Solomon, it is the maiden herself who is identified with Sheba, the virgin child and sister of Solomon, who corresponds to both the Virgin Mary and Mary Magdalene. And also the, the virgin birth and the Son of God, the seed of David, is symbolized by the Magdalene presenting the blood red egg. Right, The act of anointing the dragon queen with the fat of the water dragon. By understanding the dual meaning of the ichthys, we comprehend that the ichthys is both Christ, the anointed messe, and the salmon fish, meaning anointed vulva of the dragon princess. This means that her womb gives issue to the seed of God, which has held the virgin Christ and sheds its blood for its seed in the salvation of man, the bloody ova and the blood of Christ, the sacred womb. And the anointed can be found in the Song of Solomon. My hands are on the lock of the door. My fingers drip with myrrh, Sheba, the act of anointing the sacredness with the holiness. So you've got this idea of the seed, of the shape of the salmon, of the idea of the almond, the amygdala, right? It all kind of comes together there. Uh, interestingly enough, too, there was a passage that I was going to, uh, that I m marked here. It says, again, tying it back to that idea of the base emotions. So in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, again, this is another Nag Hammadi text. It says, um, the Gospel of Mary confirms for a short time after Jesus had been raised from the dead, some of the apostles knew nothing about it and went on believing that Christ had been crucified. The apostles wept copiously, saying, how could we possibly go to the Gentiles and preach the gospel of the kingdom of the Son of Man if they have been ruthless to them? Won't they be ruthless to us? But having already spoken with Jesus at the tomb, Mary Magdalene was able to reply, stop weeping. There is no need for grief. Take courage instead. So his grace will be with you and around you and will protect you. So here we have fear, right? So we've talked about amygdala. We've talked about fear. We've talked about spendthrift. We've talked about fornication. And now we're talking about this anxiety and fear. It says, Peter said to the sister, we know the Savior loved you more than other women. Tell us that you can remember what he said to you alone, everything that you know of him, but we do not. Mary recounted that Jesus had said to her, blessed are you for not faltering in the sight for me. And then Andrew responded, would he have spoken privately to the woman, not freely to, to us? Yes, would he have? And then Peter agrees with Andrew. And then Mary, Mary said, Mary wept and said to Peter, do you think that I thought all this up myself and that I'm not telling the truth about the Savior? And the apostles said unto Peter, and they said, you have always been hot tempered. Now I see you arguing with the women as if they were enemies. But if the Savior found her worthy, who are you indeed to reject her? The Savior surely knows her well enough. So again, arguing against her word, getting emotional. All of these figures are, and her overcoming it, like by tapped into it. She's tapped into that amygdala, right? But she's also the beloved of him. So she moves past it. Uh, yeah, so a couple other ones here that kind of go along the same line were... Um, this passage. Uh, according to the Gnostic tradition, Mary Magdalene was associated with the wisdom Sophia presented by the sun and the moon and the halo of stars. The female gnosis of Sophia was deemed to be the Holy Spirit and thus represented on earth by the Magdalene. In Revelation, describes Mary and her son and tells of her persecution, her flight into exile. And there appeared in a great wonder in heaven a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, and traveling in birth, pinned and delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon its head. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man child and the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath placed, hath a place prepared for God. And there was a war in heaven and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the great dragon was cast out, 
that old serpent and overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And so the dragon saw that he had come to the earth and he persecuted the woman which brought forth the child. And the woman were given two wings and a great eagle and she might fly into the wilderness. And the dragon was with the woman to make war over the remnants of her seed and the commandments of God at the testimony of Jesus Christ. So here we have, you know, we have this sort of, um, uh, let's call it a uh, integration story, right? It's integrating the, the fear of the generation, like the fear of generation, overcoming the generation, right? The generative, the gene, right? And that gene memory, that serpent rouge that goes back into the, into the history is, you know, we've come from dragons and yet he's come to save us and, and f free us from the dragons, right? And that anxiety of her fleeing, you know, and this is if it's Magdalene and it mirrors the two Marys, right? It's, it's Mary, um, the Virgin Mary fleeing Herod and it's Magdalene with Christ's child fleeing to, to the south of France, let's say, right? Uh, so yeah, so, um, yeah, this is what's very interesting about um, the idea of linking her to the amygdala and the idea that the... So, so yeah, so I think in, in, in wrapping it up, the idea here is um, just a small point, but could all of this reptilian talk just be um, this uh stack this tech this consciousness stack that we've got you know so in 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 having evolved if we go deep enough you know if we go past our local family anxieties and complexes right if we go past our collective unconscious social um anxieties right we go past the archetypal complexes and we go deep enough you know we descend we, we descend down into the human evolution itself, right? And we go into that serpent rouge down into the bloodline and we find they're nestled at the crossroads of being human and being a lizard. This kind of um, tree of knowledge, which is the, which is basically the, it's basically the spinal column with the, with the, with the brain atop it. And there inside of it, there's also nested in the amygdala and this idea of uh, a deep ancestral animal kind of instinct around fear, fornication, uh, and, and, and right, and then the overcoming of this, right, the marriage of the the dragon king and the the, the dragon queen, let's call them, this 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 unity, this sort of um, this this holy grail, right, this royal bloodline. Is really just a birthright to um, integrate with the right consciousness that fruit of knowledge that we have from the top of the brain stem, which is the cerebellum, with the bottom, which is rooted in the uh, in, in the in the in the reptile, right? And so all of this is just a misinterpretation of um, sort of our instinct. Our, our instinct to have fear as a, as a mechanism, our instinct to have a, a automatic response system to these things. And it's overcoming this automatic response system that is the, you know, let's call it the Christ consciousness, just to link us back to our other, um, other podcasts. The idea here is uh, when, you know, we talked about the second coming of Christ within us, the dragon power of that is is, is not to be a dragon at all. It's to fold those dragon wings, like we talked about last time, to fold it around and, and, and use the heart. You know, that heart chakra now becomes that sacred, we, we sacredize that heart. I think this has been described as a etherizing of the blood, right? So you can etherize the blood through the pineal gland, right? And again, we have the drawing here of the, the pineal gland. Uh, and this is this idea of of awakening the higher brain, right? So we've got the lower brain and then we're awakening the spiritual higher brain, which is sort of the, you know, between the pineal gland and the pituitary gland, you've got that space, you know? 
it said uh, a pineal gland is not technically part of the brain. It's not protected by the blood-brain barrier. It exists in the approximate geometric center of the brain's mass, has a hollow interior filled with fluid, and receives more blood flow than any other part of the body except the kidneys. Since it is not protected by the blood-brain barrier, the fluid inside the pineal gland gathers an increasing amount of mineral deposits over time. Uh, so this is the uh, third eye chakra corresponds to this, right? So you've got the third eye chakra that goes to this. And it says that um, brotherhoods can be traced back through time. And there was an ancient brotherhood of the snake. And this is, comes from Jim Mars, Jim Mars is a uh, secret society that hijacked the world. He says, in ancient knowledge of the Anunnaki was passed through the Sumerians, Babylonians, Syrians, and Egyptians down to the mystery schools of the Greeks, to the Romans, and on through the Knights Templar, to the Assassins, to the Rosicrucians, and to the Freemasons until it was collected together by a group of German intellectuals in the late 1700s, the Bavarian Illuminati. Founded by the Jesuit-trained academic named Adam Weishaupt in 1776, the Illuminati quickly gained a sizable membership that spread to Australia, France, England, and even to the new nation of the United States. Both founding fathers, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, revealed their awareness of the Illuminati in their writings and correspondences. The Illuminati proved a melting pot for the various cult, sects, and secret societies, which claimed to hold secrets passed on from the sky gods of old. So, so yeah. So, it, but instead of like this, this is where the the the, you know, the idea of the dragon starts to become gamed a bit, right? So the idea is this, because of the ignorance of it, um, this idea of aligning oneself to a bloodline or, or fantasizing about a, a reptilian origin, it, it, it very well could be true. There could be reptilian aliens out there, uh, a la. Um, uh, what was the book? Um, Childhood's End, right? Childhood's End, something like this, right? Where the aliens seeded us from the Anunnaki times. They were, had some reptilian kind of uh, form. But just it just seems a bit suspicious to us, right? That if we do have, uh, in the psychological tradition, part of our brain that's instinctive and having to do with these Panksepian instincts, um, religion sort of served as the meta narrative for a long time. We'll call that the meta instinct for a long time. Just by participating in a religion that explained things for us, this was the early psychology, right? And and if we look now, with the challenge of a, a say like a Rosicrucian or an anthroposophical thinking, the idea here is you know. Sure, there's a spiritual side to it, but it's also a spiritual side ground in the body, right? So you have this idea of um, uh, a sound mind and a sound body, right? The idea of spirit in the temple of the body, right? So once we put those together, you can see that there's this correspondence with the spine, the brain, the amygdala, the neocortex, uh, and that wedding of Christ and Magdalene becomes sort of that union of understanding um, ourselves as a biological being that's been infused with spirit. Like our, our, our being has, is, our spirit is participating in our bodies and, is, and get, we get to act through that. We get this sort of ability to live our lives and then reconcile that higher brain from that lower brain and it makes a very interesting argument, right? It's just an interesting uh, theory. I, I'm curious what, do you, what you guys think. I mean, do you guys think that there really could be an alien agenda? Because I'm open to it. I'm open that there could be something like this. Um, I'm also open to this idea of this dragon mythology, which takes us back to, uh, you know, maybe just these origin stories of um, Sumer and uh, some kind of, uh, alternate history version of it and then but but also I'm op open to the idea of it's just a biological coincidence it seems that we also did evolve and if we take evolution back far enough there could be some resonances back to like a morphogenic resonance back to earlier stages I mean in some ways could the 
mammalian, uh, the diminished nature of mammals in the age of reptiles be stored somewhere in the genome. And it, as we get higher thinking, it expresses itself in, a, in an image of a dragon. And we've sort of built up that uh, Jungian reptile imagery over the generations for so long that it's part of our construct, but it really has its origins in evolution. All right, so it's very interesting stuff. Uh, I'd love to hear your guys' comments below. Dragons, thumbs up or thumbs down, reptilian origins, or the magic of the Magdalene amygdala. Uh, let me know what you guys think. As always, uh, thanks for watching, and we will see you in the next podcast. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.